So, welcome to Layer One Sunday edition. Uh, our first talk is this brave soul who forego before, before wins. <laughs> four wins, I suppose. Uh, last night's party. Uh, this is Karthik Rahman, and his talk is selecting features to classify memoir. Thanks everyone for joining me this early in the morning. Um, my name is Karthik and I work on the uh, Adobe Secure Software Engineering team. I'll tell you a little bit about what my team does. Uh, the team I specifically work on is the product security incident response team and we're part of the wider security team within Adobe. Um, so we are the public face of security and incident response to the rest of the world and uh, researchers send uh, reports of vulnerabilities to us and we analyze these reports and work with the various product teams such as Reader and Flash Player to give you a couple of examples. Uh, we work with these teams to create the fixes, to verify the fixes. We go back to the researchers who submitted these reports and um, once the fixes are good to go, we publish bulletins and acknowledge researchers. And uh, another important project that I'm, I'm involved with is a project called MAP, the Microsoft Active Protections Program. And uh, it's a, it's a pre-notification program giving vulnerability details to trusted partners and uh, Adobe joined this program in 2010, uh, July, and we've been um, active contributors to the content in that program ever since. But the topic of today's talk is something totally different. I, I wanted to ask this question to start off my talk. How many of you have seen this uh, screen on your machine or on the screen of a loved one? All right. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, some of the talks have been scheduled the way they have been. Um, so the audience got a preview of uh, machine learning in um, one of the talks yesterday. And uh, in another talk, there was some coverage of uh, mass malware in, in, related to, in relation to botnets. And uh, I'm glad we, we uh, covered those topics because uh, they're a good introduction to some of the material I'll cover today. And today, the objectives are um, to sort of explain from a high level what the malware problem is and um, answer the question from the point of view of the user. Um, who see screens like that we just saw a second ago and ask themselves, how did I just get infected? And the second part is a brief introduction to the application of machine learning to the problem of uh, malware classification. And uh, my, my secret objective is sort of to introduce machine learning to, to people who haven't worked in that field and um, sort of give you a roadmap of how you could apply machine learning to the problems of malware analysis or other computer security problems because it's, uh, it's an area that is picking up interest in our community as uh, was evident from the talks yesterday. Okay, so let's, uh, let's walk through the story. You are a regular visitor to a website and uh, that website unfortunately is compromised. Um, a couple of months ago, a whistleblowing website called Krypton.org was uh, compromised and uh, was serving up drive-by exploits. So you as a user, um, you're not too computer savvy, but you use your computer, you browse the web obviously, and one of the sites that you trust is compromised. Or uh, you get a link in an email and uh, you click on the link that you don't really know much about and you're directed to a website that's malicious. Another technique that is used to rank uh, pages and search results higher than legitimate pages is search engine optimization. So, Whatever the technique, you are directed to a website that is serving um, exploits. And you're served something like this. You know, you have to spend a little bit of time in a JavaScript debugger to deobfuscate this. And um, the talk on botnets yesterday covered some of the, some of the steps in deobfuscating malicious JavaScript and getting to the point where you can um, see a legitimate or a malicious URL uh, decipher from this. So once you did that, you'd be redirected. The user would be redirected to um, something that looks legitimate but in fact is malicious. So, you know, if the user were to inspect the start of this URL, he'd think that he's going to Google Analytics website, but the, uh, I've uh, truncated the end of the URL because it's malicious. And he or she is routed to, through a series of fast flux networks. Again, this is a topic that was covered yesterday. So, at the, at the end of that chain, when the user has finally served a piece of malware, it could be served something like a keylogger, which is something that installs itself on the user's computer and uh, logs information he types in in memory or in, on, or, um, in a file on disk, and then beacons his information out to the attacker servers. Or it could be served a backdoor or any other category of malware, whatever the uh, attacker's intent is, is uh, reached at this stage. 
So if antivirus that's installed on a user's machine, um, and uh, consensus is, is generally that users of Windows computers should have some sort of antivirus installed. At this stage, if antivirus fails to detect the malware that's served by that website at the end of that chain of fast flux networks, that's when the user's machine experiences, in a manner of speaking, a mushroom cloud. <laughs> or worse, something like this. If the uh, malware is poorly engineered, um, it could cause a blue screen of death and make the data on the user's computer irrecoverable. But you all know this stuff. So the equation I'd like to offer as, the, as a model for how mass malware spreads and is effective is the combination of mass malware with dated AV signatures leads to mass infections. And uh, the topic that we'll analyze in more depth is the second piece of the equation, which is why dated, um, uh, what, what are dated AV signatures and why do signatures get to be dated? So let's ask that question. Why do AV signatures get to be out of date? Well, one example is, uh, one explanation is the malware obfuscation testing and release cycle. <coughs> so two of the uh, Trojan families that were mentioned in the botnet talk yesterday were SpyEye and Zeus. And as uh, coincidence would have it. The, I have screenshots of two of those um, to prove my um, example. Uh, so this is a screenshot of the SPY Trojan. And if you purchase a copy of this, of this toolkit, you'd see something like this on, on your machine. And remember, you're a bad guy at this point. And I'll call your attention to that uh, circle on the screen, which is uh, a field for encryption key. So you as the bad guy, you're setting up a wave of malware infections. And you want to create a, a piece of malware that's undetected or fairly undetected by uh, the scores of AVs. Um, what, what do you do at that point? You use an interface like this to um, specify a custom encryption key. And uh, you're, ho you're hopeful that that custom encryption key will bypass a bunch of AVs out there. And so if AV signatures in the past are written to a specific encryption key, then they'll miss the decryption of this and detection of this piece of malware because uh, the encryption key has changed. Another source of obfuscation is uh, notified by, uh, is indicated by the second circle, which is um, the packer, UPX in this case. Um, and quickly, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with what a packer is, it's a sheath in which to cloak your malware. Uh, now, packers, like any other technology, have both legitimate and uh, nefarious uses. Um, you know, so if you're a game developer and you want to protect your game from being reverse engineered uh, or make it really hard for people to use your software without paying appropriate royalties, then you might cloak it within um, a packer. But the uh, malicious use case here is uh, to sheath malware within a packer. So if an AV uh, scanner doesn't have the means of uh, unpacking a, a specific packer, then it'll be completely undetected by it. So in the SPY case, you have both encryption and the use of, uh, of packers. So step one was adding obfuscation and encryption to the malware. The next step is uh, quality assurance for the malware guys. <coughs> they may send their samples to a website like VarsTotal. How many people are familiar with VarsTotal? It's a, it's a website based in, in Spain, and what it offers is a, is a score of AV software that you can scan your binaries with. Um, now, if you're an AV analyst, the, uh, the use case is you're analyzing a sample and you want a quick preview of what other AV companies detect the sample as. So you, you may upload it there. and. Uh, get a report of uh, what other people detect it as and what they're calling it. But the bad guys could use it you know, equally. And uh, to, uh, to figure out how many AVs out there detect the piece of malware that they're trying to set up and serve via this wave of infections. And in this case, you know, this is just a screenshot of a random sample. It seemed like uh, 28 out of 42 AVs detected this particular sample. Now, the bad guys might look at this ratio of detection, or or rather the ratio of, of uh, what is not detected. In this case, it's uh, 14 out of, the, uh, out of the 42 AVs that don't detect this particular sample. And uh, if that number is uh, too low, they may just go back to the drawing board and say, you know, I, I want a more effective mass malware campaign, and I'm going to add different kinds of encryption or different kinds of packing or layers of packing in order to make my malware more effective and infect as many computers as possible in the first run. And um, yeah, this is a screenshot of the Zeus or Zbot Trojan. And uh, if the malware guys were uh, unhappy with that step of qual QA quality testing of uh, how many AVs detected their piece of malware, they'd go back to this step and add different kinds of encryption or, or packing.
Polypack is an academic project by Oberheide et al. Um, and the point I'm trying to drive home here is that uh, the, in addition to using a single packer, you know, you could multiply the effects of what a packer does to make uh, AV ineffective by adding more and more packers and layers. And I'll pause for, for a brief minute and, and let you guys read the abstract of that. So if the effect of a packer is to make the job of an AV um, less effective, then you can multiply that effect by adding layers of packers, and that's what this project does. Now, this is an academic project, and the results are published, and the methodology is published, but it doesn't strain the imagination to, to say that the bad guys could have you know, custom setups like this and uh, they're, as, as part of their QA testing, and uh, uh, once, they, once they have a, a, a string of um, packers uh, added on to their malware, th that's when they're happy with it and release it. In summary, the malware obfuscation testing release cycle begins with um, you know, a toolkit that lets people, lets the malware guys add um, encryption and different kinds of obfuscation. They pass it on to the uh, uh, public AV scanning engines such as VirusTotal or use things like uh, Polypack to add different kinds of layers of packing. And if they're happy with, unhappy with uh, how many AVs detected, they'll go back to step one and change up the encryption or obfuscation. Once they're content with the level of detection, they'll serve it um, in a mass malware campaign by infected web pages and, and drive by exploit downloads. And once that wave of uh, infection is successful and AV catches up with the lag, they'll go back to step one and start another campaign of mass malware. So that's, that's a vicious cycle for um, malware, mass malware. And from the point of view of the user, you know, the user doesn't care about all this. What, what he or she suffers is this, unfortunately. These are screenshots of <laughs> malicious programs that pretend to be legitimate. Um, and these are actually screenshots from uh, the Microsoft Malware Protection Center blog of fake antivirus or ransomware programs. And the user who doesn't know better believes or is connived into believing that these are legitimate programs if they pay uh, a $50 or something um, license fee for, they'll, they'll get rid of the infection. But these programs do nothing but, <coughs> but scam the user. So the point of, point of discussing all of that is, is this uh, thesis, uh, is that malware, um, for malware, the software development life cycle outpaces that of antivirus. And in, in a lot of cases, uh, this is economically driven. Um, the malware guys make a lot of money from doing this, and some, somewhere that's, that's part of their, their motives and, and the impetus. And the antivirus industry is, um, is slow. <laughs> so the natural question to ask at this point is, uh, well, how can we make AV more current? How can we make the job of AV more effective? And then surveying the, the research in this, um, an automatic answer is, uh, well, you've got you've to automate everything. And research discusses things like static detection, which is uh, detecting malware for what it looks like, detecting malware for what it does, dynamic detection, detection in the cloud, so detecting certain features of malware or the preponderance of a certain hash of malware, but is there anything else that we can do? I'm glad the speaker badges <laughs> look the way they do because they remind me of the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica. And it's just a coincidence because we need the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica on our side. We need machine learning. <laughs> the machine learning is the, uh, the process of extracting useful knowledge from uh, masses of data. So we're transitioning into part two of the talk, which is uh, defining more terms and uh, building up our knowledge towards how we could apply machine learning to help classify malware. So let's define a virus briefly, because it's, it's a term that is thrown about easily, and uh, maybe some, some people don't know the original definitions. Fred Cohen, who wrote the first computer virus and was one of the original researchers in the antivirus field, defined a virus as a program that can infect other programs by modifying them to include a possibly evolved copy of itself. Now, some people complain about this definition that it could also apply to general purpose programs such as compilers. And Peter Zor, who's another um, eminent researcher and one of the earliest researchers in, in the uh, industry, uh, redefined a virus as a program that can rec recursively and explicitly copy a possibly evolved copy of itself. And this is the most widely de accepted definition of uh, viruses today. So let's take a 
quick trip down memory lane, computer memory lane, that is. This is a screenshot of uh, one of the original computer viruses called Brain. And the uh, interesting thing about Brain was the, uh, that the address of the, the people who wrote the virus was embedded within the machine language code of the virus. <laughs> um, so Brain spread by a floppy net, sneaker net, and uh, it would, you know, you'd have to insert a floppy disk in the machine that had Brain on it. It would copy itself onto the disk, and you'd walk over to another machine, and you'd, you'd spread Brain like that. Now, um, Miko Hipponen, the uh, CEO or CTO of F-Secure, did a TED talk um, some time back in which he looked at the assembly language of Brain and asked himself the question, so do these guys still, the guys who wrote this virus, do they still live at this address? And he actually went to this address and knocked on their door and, um, yeah, lo and behold, they were still there. So I'll give you a link to that TED talk at the end of this talk. It's a, it's a pretty neat uh, anecdote. From spreading via sneaker net or floppy net, uh, worms or viruses evolved to spreading by exploiting operating system vulnerabilities. And these are all broad strokes in the evolution of malware, by the way. Um, so when I, when I went back to my college campus at the end of the uh, summer of 2003, the, the entire network was down. Um, I was curious and went to the IT department. And they said, yeah, we've been, we're getting hit by the MS Blaster worm. So that's my personal relationship with the MS Blaster worm, not being able to use the network. But if you looked at the machine language code within MS Blaster, uh, you know, virus writers actually tend to do this a lot. They'll put in English language messages and they'll, they'll plead to the virus analysts to, to use a particular name for the virus. And we just ignore that stuff, but it's interesting to, sh to share. Uh, but uh, the uh, writer of, of MS Blaster put in a message to Bill Gates. Stop, why do you make this possible? Stop making money and fix your software. <laughs> and they did, they passed it within a couple of weeks. <laughs> So in addition to being the device used by the, uh, the Greeks to besiege Troy for computer viruses, a Trojan horse is what we've seen so far. It's, it's a program that pretends to be legitimate, but in fact uh, does something bad or does nothing at all, but scam the user. OK, so we're almost <laughs> completely done with part one, and we're doing very good on time. Um, any questions so far about part one? All right, so we're going to look at machine learning for malware classification. More definitions. Uh, the scope of the research was classification of polymorphic malware particularly. What do I mean by polymorphic? A piece of malware has multiple variants and does not affect other programs. You may call a virus that mutates or evolves uh, an infector. Um, and you may call a, a virus that mutates and changes its shape. Um, you could call it metamorphic. So those two categories of viruses were out of scope for my research. And examples of what is in scope um, are backdoors, which are programs that run in the background, collect information, and beacon that out to the attacker servers. Downloaders, which um, download other programs and let the user have a presence on your machine. And one of the kind, one of the tools that the user, that the attacker could download on on a machine is a RAT, a remote administration tool, which lets him uh, run commands on the machine and perhaps like control a botnet or something like that. Yeah, infectors and and packers are scope too. The objective of of a packer is to make one binary resemble another as much as possible. So if a binary contains sections that <coughs> are low in entropy, the objective of the packer is to make the sections within the binary as um, as high entropy as possible. Um, and th that's a more difficult problem to address using machine learning than uh, uh, trying to classify files that were originally not packed. So that's, that's within the scope of this research. Okay, so why is polymorphic mal malware important and, and how, how much of it is out there in relation to the other categories of malware? Um, this is a screenshot uh, from a couple of weeks ago of um, what, what percentage of malware detected, uh, what percentage of malware out there is Trojans, which are polymorphic, as opposed to um, other categories of malware, and something like 80%. <coughs> a little more amplification of what I mean by polymorphic. This is a, a family of termite, species of termite. Uh, the, the, on the left is a king termite, A. B is a, is a queen termite. C and D are secondary and tertiary queens. E is soldier termites, and uh, F is a worker termite. Now, these, all, these are all the same species, but they, they don't look the same. They, you know, they're dissimilar in appearance. 
but it doesn't mean that we have to classify them differently. So polymorphism is uh, the labeling of one thing as one species, regardless of how they appear, because their function is the same. They're all termites. They do similar things. There's polymorphism in Battlestar Galactica. How many Battlestar Galactica fans here? All right. <laughs> the Cylons are all polymorphic. They, they have similar purposes, but they look different. So say you achieve classification. What are some of the uh, other steps that follow in the methodology for um, analyzing binaries for antivirus analysis? The next step is clustering. So you classify malware as um, malicious or clean. And for the files that you classified as malicious, the next step is to assign families. Um, that's what's meant by clustering. Going hand in hand with clustering is something known as detection. So this is the most commonly used term for antiviruses. Antiviruses detect malware. But uh, what, what's going on behind the scenes is the clustering has happened, and classification preceded that. And if your system has already been infected by a piece of malware, then after you detect it, the antivirus is supposed to delete it and clean up any other remnants, like registry keys or uh, remnants in memory so that the malware doesn't respawn on reboot and then delete whatever else is left on the, on the system. So on, at a high level, though, that's what's involved in antivirus scanning and, and cleaning. Um, so in the course of the research, there's a lot of similar research and I wanted to give you sort of a preview of this stuff. So if you're interested in it, you could look it up easily. Um, Rikadal, uh, a group based in Germany, um, they mine malware behavior based on um, sandboxes. Those are the collected sandbox logs and use those logs as features to, to feed into machine learning algorithms. So in general, this is the machine learning approach to analyzing or classifying malware. Um, two groups separately used a, a search engine method to try to classify malware. So they looked at the contents of the malware and they added it to a search engine database. And when an unknown binary came by their way, they'd extract similar features and do a search engine sort of lookup. So when you search something on Google, it does a lookup of, uh, of a corpus of data, uh, whatever is similar, um, cosine um, similarity method, for example. And that's what they applied to the problem of malware classification. For malware detection, um, another group um, used a technique from biology known as phylogeny, which is uh, a term that means building up a family tree of malware. And once you apply this technique, um, the malware would already be classified and within a tree that was indicative of its malicious nature and uh, whatever appropriate category it belonged to. Another technique was the use of nPerms. Um, nPerms is the permutation of an n-gram. Is anyone familiar with what an n-gram is? No. Would you mind defining it? It's a, when you have uh, patterns of uh, like, like usually context of a multiple strings in a row. Like a three gram, three string, and you can find patterns. Cool. Cool. So, thank you. Uh, n-grams is, are exactly that. They're, they're used, they come from linguistics, but you can apply um, that concept to, to malware. And you can basically say, I'll define a unit to be one byte or a series of bytes, and a sequence of those units becomes an n-gram. And if you permutate that in which you don't care about the order in which those uh, units appear, that's an n-perm. So they, they use a technique like that to, to build a phylogeny, and uh, it was an application of both machine learning and the search engine approach. A different approach was uh, using the control flow graphs within uh, the binaries of malware to derive a fingerprint of the malware. And this is a geometric or structural similarity approach. Uh, a different group did something similar. They, they looked at control flow graphs and basic blocks and also used uh, machine learning or search engines. And there's, there's a lot of theoretical research also in um, how to normalize viruses. So people define um, formal, use formal logic, formal methods to um, specify the syntax and semantics of what's contained within a binary. And then if um, by applying normalization methods, binaries that are similar would be more and more similar, and binaries that are different would be more and more distant. And then they, they finally use a, a clustering method to sort of uh, put that malware in the same families. Okay, so that's a broad <coughs> strokes overview of uh, what's going on in, in detection. In uh, clustering, fingerprinting is also a, a common method that people use, and uh, Rumley and, and Zhang and uh, Wichersky both published fingerprinting algorithms for clustering malware. So if you're doing this for fun or you're doing this for your job, you can look up their papers and, and implement their algorithms for, um, for clustering. And a group based in Spain 
um, used distance algorithms to define similar malware. So they they project or they they use they put malware into Euclidean space, and uh, similar malware will be close to each other in that space. And Bayerdahl, another group based in Germany, um, again used machine learning. Um, and uh, they derived a behavioral profile of malware, and this tool is actually available for anyone to use. It's called Anubis. So now that we've looked at all the strategies out there, um, I, w I wanted to give you um, a methodology that I followed to, to use machine learning to apply to classification. The first step is to extract features. Then you train the models using the features you extracted, and the models would generate classifiers. If you're happy with the results of the classifiers, you'd use them to classify unknown files as, as uh, zero, which might be clean, and one as malicious or dirty. And in the beginning, I, I started with 600 features derived from a binary file. So what is a binary, what do I mean by binary file? Um, the majority of systems out there are still 32-bit, um, and uh, the EXC and DLL are portable executable file formats for 32-bit systems. Uh, the, the standard is, is public. You could go to the Microsoft website and download the standard. Um, to, I wanted to give you a preview of what this looked like visually. Um, this, is a, this is a tool called uh, File Insight, and uh, it, it has a P parser built into it. So if you, if you open a binary within that, it would show you the structures within a particular P file. And this is a section of the P file from the P header. The P also contains um, sections within itself, so dot text, our data, resource, these are all sections. It also could contain imports, so what, what it uses from the uh, operating system's <coughs> API, that's, that's what I mean by import. And DLLs might also have exports, so there's, there's a functionality programmed to the DLL and another program wants to use it, so uh, that's what's meant by an export. And this binary doesn't have exports. A little more about what I mean by features. Um, this, is, this is the Primula flower, and uh, the picture on the left and the right are both Primula flowers. So feature one is the Corolla, feature two is the Calyx, and they're both in the same place in both these flowers. But feature three, the stamen, is in a different place, and so is feature four. Does this, does, do features three and four make these two different flowers? No, they don't. They're just in different positions. And why are they in different f positions? The function of polymorphism in biology is to let the species be more robust in the face of adversaries and uh, predators. And a similar logic can follow for polymorphic malware. Why do the malware writers uh, introduce polymorphism into their malware? They want their malware to be more robust in the face of detection by antiviruses. So another nuance that I had to explore in, in this research is why might fewer features be better than more features to feed to machine learning algorithms? And at first, it's counterintuitive. You'd think that the more data you supply to your problem, the better results you'd get. Actually, that's not true. The uh, textbooks on machine learning tell you that irrelevant features actually distract the machine learning algorithms. And by using the appropriate features, you can improve the performance, you can represent the problem better, and it also helps the user because they aren't distracted by the irrelevant features. So back to the example of the, the Primula flower. If the base of the flower had been used as a feature to separate something as a primula versus something that wasn't, it's no use at all because it's the same in, in both the, both the uh, examples of the primula. The here's the research that's, that was most relevant to the stuff I was doing. Um, the reason I pointed out is that a lot of people had achieved very good accuracy in the results. And uh, as I was trying to think of what are the questions I could try to pursue, uh, it seemed like there were two key questions that um, were still unaddressed by the existing research. And the first of these was which features could be used in machine learning for classification, classifying malware and why? And a related question was what are the minimum features for good classification? So a lot of, these, a lot of this research would, would take all the features available or predefined set of features but not focus on minimizing that features to figure out what set of minimum features were necessary to classify. And uh, I was able to actually derive excellent classification using just seven features for that data set. And how this could be used is it could be an existing layer to antivirus technology. But it doesn't, doesn't mean the end of AV. You know, we still need unpackers and deobfuscators um, and all the other stuff that, that um, 
are currently part of antivirus technology. So how did the system look? You have a data set, which is your corpus of malware and corpus of clean files, from which you extract features using a parser. This is fed into a classifier, which is a machine learning algorithm, which has been trained to identify something as, mal as malicious and something that's clean. Um, so when you're training these classifiers originally, you want to evaluate them. So you, you take the model that comes out of the classifier and you evaluate it for you know, what, the, what the false positive rates are, what the accuracy is, and, and so on, other metrics. And if you're satisfied with the evaluation, you may take that model and use it within um, another testing system. In the beginning, um, I started with, uh, to, for my parser, I started with a tool called PE Dump, which is a, which is a legacy tool for parsing P, the P file format. And later, when I, when I distilled this research to a tool that other people could, could run, I used the P file Python module, which is a, it's an open source module. What is my data set? It was 100,000, uh, a little more than 100,000 pieces of malware from the VX Havens uh, website. Uh, if you've been following the, uh, the Twitter sphere and, and news, a few months ago this website was actually shut down. So I did this research in, in good time. Uh, the 16,000 clean programs came from base installations of Windows XP and Windows 7. I started with 645 features initially, uh, features extracted from uh, properties of the PE file format and some of the features I had to calculate. So machine learning algorithms, they, they tend to accept a certain kind of feature. You know, it could be all numeric, all nom nominal, or all binary. Um, I, I decided to go with numeric features because that seemed to represent most of the data within a PE file. And so some of the calculations had to be whether something contained an import or whether something um, contained an export, for example. So that's, that's what I mean by calculated features. And uh, Matt Petrick's article, it was very insightful and helpful in my analysis. For the classifier and evaluator, I used an open source Java project called Weka. And if you're starting off with uh, machine learning, I, I'd say this is absolutely the place to start off with because it dramatically cut my learning curve about machine learning. Um, so there's, there's a lot of algorithms in machine learning that have been implemented by this. Um, by this framework, and uh, it's, it's really awesome because it's also scriptable. So you don't need to use that GUI. If you've figured out what your objectives are in, in deriving a classifier, you could uh, just simply tell Wicca um, to run that classifier um, on your data behind the scenes. So I, I ran six numeric machine learning algorithms on my data. Uh, I started with 645 features and in the second experiment with 100 features. Um, and I, I also ran uh, these classifiers individually against particular features, and I wanted to check the classification. So this is, these are the results, and some of these features had pretty high accuracy. But wait a minute. Do you know who that is from Battlestar Galactica? Leoben. <laughs> Leoben. Check the classification. Some of these features individually had really, really high accuracy. And that actually, that, that, that was staggering because, you know, in theory, you could use just one of these features to separate malware from clean files for that data set, and you'd have an accuracy of 92.34%. Okay, so to answer the question, um, is it possible to derive a feature set that's as small as possible instead of using all the, all the available features? How could I go about that? I went about grouping the P structure headers into buckets. Created seven buckets based on uh, the portions of the P file. And the algorithm for deriving this minimum feature set went something like this. Um, I started with just one feature from the first bucket. I ran all the algorithms I was interested in running. Then went to the next bucket, took the best feature from that bucket, and then ran the six machine learning algorithms with those two features. So I continued this process and, and noted my results for one through seven features. When the seven were done, I, I went back to the first bucket and took the next best feature from that bucket and then continued. So I ran this for 13 iterations, so all the way to seven and then back to 13. And if the question that, if the question that is it possible to derive a minimum feature set for good classification of malware could be answered, then I should have seen an inflection point in my results after a certain minimum set of features were met, after which the results were just similar and, and the gain in accuracy was minimal. And indeed, that, that was the case. 
So these are results from instant based learning, one of the machine learning algorithms I use. And here you see after seven features, there is an inflection point, and uh, the gain in accuracy is, is not as dramatic as the gain in accuracy all the way through the, the first seven features. Similar results for the J48 classifier, the J48 graph, inflection point in seven features. Similar for part, seems like there's an inflection point at six, but for consistency, let's just say seven. Similarly for random forest, rider. Okay, so then I took just these seven features and used them as the, the sole inputs to the classifiers. And with just those seven features, it seemed like I was able to derive a really, really high accuracy in, in classifying malware. So there was a 98.21 accuracy, um, and uh, the false positive rate was really high. So, you know, if you're doing this commercially or if you're doing this in a production system, you probably should not use machine learning algorithms right out of the gate without optimization and tuning. But it's still great. I mean, we got a 98.21% accuracy for 130,000 pieces of malware with just seven features. <coughs> so you may ask, how did, how did these seven features individually or in combination work so well? Well, it seemed like they were picking uh, the machine learning algorithms were picking the features that were separating malware from clean files immediately and then adding the other features in nominally. So if we in our manual analysis picked the seven features in our data set that separated the two classes of data the best, then we wouldn't need to worry about collecting the data for other features and distracting our machine learning algorithms. And for my data set, these were the seven features. Um, you can read them on the screen, but if you're familiar with uh, analyzing the structure of binary, you might recognize some of these. Debug size denotes the size of uh, the debug directory table. And uh, one explanation, post hoc, just because we don't have the data to back it up. One possible explanation, post hoc, is that this is a good feature to separate malware from clean files because only Microsoft-related executables, not even DLLs, had this feature populated. And none of the malware that, that was in my data set had any value set in this, in this field. So immediately, that was a good feature for the machine learning algorithms to separate clean from dirty. A similar logic applied to image version, which denotes the version of a file. Um, and only Microsoft-related binaries had this value set to something that was non-zero. And all the, all the malware uh, that I analyzed had, this, had nothing in here. So in my calculations of those feature values, I just set this value to zero. So how might you use the models that you, you generate from training your classifiers? Uh, you have an unclassified P file. You feed it to a parser. The parser feeds the data to a model, and the model gives you a result, basically, input and output. You could plug all of this into existing AV infrastructures. On the desktop, you could use it to consolidate signature databases. So you have a trove of malware that you want to detect and, and classify. And you know, if you have a huge signature database, you could run machine learning against this database and derive a, a compressed model that captures what that malware is. In the cloud, you could be more aggressive with the, uh, the rate in which you run these algorithms. Um, you could use it to quickly detect mass malware as it's spreading within, uh, across uh, computers. On the gateway, perhaps you could use this most aggressively. Um, you could actually prevent worms from spreading by applying some of the, uh, some of the models that you train. So I, I distilled a lot of this research into a quick tool. It's called a uh, mal classifier. It's on SourceForge already, if you want to take a look at it. Uh, the objective of that is to share this research with the community and, and sort of uh, help you guys build on it. So it's an open source license, so you can build on it at will. In closing, I'd say that if you're interested in machine learning um, for computer security in general and malware classification in particular, please start with Weko because you'll save yourself a lot of time. I was faced with uh, either uh, coding the machine learning algorithms myself or using Weko, and you can imagine how much time I save by using Weko. There's a book that, that accompanies Weka. It's not free, but I, I highly recommend it because it uses Weka as its teaching model. And uh, the publishers did a neat thing of, uh, of giving an example of what machine learning is. There's a, there's a big cat in the weeds, and it sort of exemplifies the definition of uh, extracting useful knowledge from, from raw data. So I've actually been asked this question before, and to anticipate what some of you may, may ask. So, um, I just talked about seven features that separate malware from clean files from my data set. 
if there's a malware author out there who reads my paper and uh, says, you know, I know these seven features and I'm going to program my malware so that those seven features fall, the values of those seven features fall within the parameters that I expect to find for clean programs. And uh, the answer to that is, yeah, sure, but it doesn't really change the, uh, the nature of the, uh, the arms race that's already existing. And that, that thing is a quote from, from the book. The bad guys can also use machine learning. Well, as with any science or technology, the, both the good, bad, good guys and the bad guys can use the same things. But can the human analyst benefit from using machine learning? I think so. Um, can anyone here tell me which of these two is a projector lens and which of these two is a camera lens? Anyone want to take a guess? One on the right is a camera. Cool. Would you thank you? Would Would you agree that it, it's sort of a hard thing to hard question to answer? So the point I'm driving at is the uh, the technology to you know project light and the technology to create light um, is to capture light is is very similar, and uh, the analogy is the technology to to write viruses and the technology to detect viruses will also resemble each other. And um, you know, so the bad guys can use machine learning, but I think it can buy the good guys more time. And when we're faced with like tons of malware coming out every day, by using machine learning algorithms that self-train and self-correct, the human analyst could be focused on the more longer-term research and more important questions that you know is uh, less taxing on them. Another thing that the AV industry gets hit a lot with is uh, is a high-profile false positive. Now, I couldn't say what your business, uh, how your business um, assigns costs to what false positives and false negatives in your technology are. But the neat thing about machine learning is if you have a value to plug into these equations for machine learning, um, that could be one of the inputs used to train your classifiers. So you could have a classifier that's attuned to your particular business problem. And everyone's calculation there is going to be different, so I couldn't tell you what it's going to be. A final note is to please consider the privacy of the user. Um, if you're running this uh, machine learning infrastructure for detecting or classifying malware in the cloud, and uh, you wantonly extract features from, from developers' machines, for example, um, you could be extracting things like strings from developers' machines, which leak intellectual property into the cloud. And if there's a breach, then we know what a particular company was working on. Um, it, to that, I'd say there is research on privacy preserving data mining. It, it was actually out of scope of the textbook I re referred you to. So uh, if you're interested in that, please look up the research in that field. This is the research I alluded to that was most close to my own research. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, please do read this. This is the TED talk I talked about where Miko Hipponen goes to the address in question of uh, the guys who wrote the brain virus and, and has a conversation with them. <laughs> And my thanks to these references for images and content. So I'm going to leave you with, I'm a Battlestar Galactica geek. I'm going to leave you with my contribution to the problem of classifying Cylons in Battlestar Galactica. So if you don't watch the show, towards the end of the show, your objective is to classify who is a Cylon and who is a human, because the Cylons resemble humans. So you don't have four seasons to catch up. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you four Cylons here. It's not all of them. It's not all of them, and uh, I'll tell you that my my classification has a false positive rate of 20 percent. So you'll just have to watch the show to correct it. <laughs> that's it. So the uh, that's my email address. If you have any questions, and the tool that distills some of the research I did is, is up on SourceForge as an open source project. That's it. I'll take any questions. Early on, you you sent a site to Spain, which I heard is Barcelona. Virus total. How do you spell that? Virus, V I R U S T O T A L. Is there? I believe you said that all your good programs were from uh, Microsoft Windows installation. Yes. Uh, are you concerned that you're just discerning between a Microsoft product and yeah. other? Sure. Uh, so it's always a concern in machine learning to overfit your, your models to your data set rather than solving the general problem. So that's a valid concern, and uh, I, my constraints were the availability of clean programs and uh, whatever dirty programs I could get my hands on to, to sort of like 
prove or disprove this hypothesis. And the hypothesis was, yeah, it's possible with a few features to separate clean and dirty. So if you reapply this research, you'd have to use different programs and sort of use more files to, to make it generic to the, the wider problem in, in the wild. What else? All right, thank you very much.